A very warm welcome to my community, I'm Sherwood McCaskey. As always, I'm pleased that you have joined us. The family is considered to be one of the more important eunuchs of society. They bear the primary responsibility for the socialization of the children, as well as instilling values of citizenship and a sense of belonging in the society. Families do make communities. This week, Mr. King begins by honoring a number of the families in the community of Green Hill. There were some outstanding families who were part of the landscape of Green Hill from the late 19th century, early 20th century. And indeed, there was a cluster of those families in the village of Mahaika. There was the Williams family. In fact, one of the last child from that Williams family died at 107 years old, about two years ago, Millicent Williams. And then there was the mother of Dr. Barlow Lynch and his seven brothers and two sisters who were my closest childhood friends growing up in Green Hill. Barlow Lynch is a urologist who practices here from time to time. Well respected in the United States. Another Buxton boy taught by some outstanding teachers like Eileen Robinson Cumberbatch who was our primary school teacher. Um, we had in that community the World Family there was a gentleman, Mr. Collins World, who looked after a lot of the agricultural holdings of people in the area. Like Mr. Byron Lynch, the father of Barlow Lynch and others, Burchell, Clyde, Barry, um, Ruben, and um, Erskine Urich, who retired a few years ago as an accountant with the United Nations. And then we had people like Reverend Frank Barker and his family. That was an outstanding family of Mahaika. Reverend Frank Barker and my mother were childhood friends. Uncle Frank was born in 1906 and my mother, Leota Garner King, was born in 1907. He died at 91 in 1997 and my mother died at 91 in 1998. And my mother always regretted that she was not able to follow him into teaching as a pupil teacher because her grandmother and aunt said, but you know, why are you going into teaching? They do not pay the teachers anything. And then you go and get married and next thing you know, you have to give up your job. So it was a waste of time. So go and learn to be a seamstress and work for yourself. Hence my mother never got the opportunity to be a teacher other than to teach us. And as she always said, when they got into the metric system, she had some problems. <laughs> but she did very well teaching us and helping us with homework, etc. But th these older families were important to life in Green Hill, the leadership among some of the people. And Reverend Barker, who he became later when he retired in the Moravian Church, was really an outstanding teacher and was one of the early teachers at Butson School. In fact, he taught my late uncle, Martin Garner, who died at 98 years old in 2011, I think, oh, no, 93 years old, sorry, 2011, December 26th in Fort Myers, Florida, in Southwest Florida. And he had all kinds of stories about life in Green Hill and in Mahaika. So the Garner family was also one of the families that were there for years. In fact, there's still many relatives of the um, Barker clan that have made great contributions to this country. You know, Maisie Barker, well, she obviously know, and her children, Professor Pedro and um, Sonia, who is a diplomat and senior civil service, and my colleague in the Foreign Service. It was also the children of and you know, see, there was Yolanda and Peter, those were Maisie's children. But then there was also the sister of Reverend Frank Barker. She was Yuri King, married one of the many Frank Kings who lived in Green Hill at one stage. And they lived in Green Hill until about 1955, 56, and they moved to Heinz Hill in Cave Hill. 
and those were Sylvia, the late Sylvia, King Morrison, Marion Ford, um, Lady Grace Franklin, and Maggie Kinghood, who lives in Massachusetts. They all lived in Green Hill. And the three boys were Louis, who was at Harrison College around Tony, my brother Tony's time. There was Frankie, who was a little older than I am. And then there was the late Terry, who left Harrison College and worked with Barclays and unfortunately died in an accident, I think sometime around 1974. But that was a very close family, the Barkers. And then there was Tom Barker, who was the brother. And Tom was the father of the well-known cricket umpire Lloyd Barker, who also was a Buxtonian and then Harrison College. Didn't play cricket, but he would score for the school teams. And then, of course, Senator Tyrone Barker, who did extremely well at both Buxton and at university in physics and maths. Then there was Michael, who was my classmate. Michael taught for years at Parkinson School. I think he taught maths also, but he was well known as a drafts player. Spent a lot of his time playing draft. And then there were younger ones, the Carl, etc. And the, 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 the daughter, the oldest girl, was um, Anne Barker Carter, who worked for many years as a secretary in the um, public service. And she's retired now. But that family, and Mrs. Barker, a very wonderful lady who died a few years ago. But the family started a church, built a church with their own hands and went in Bushall Yard Gap. And they contributed a lot, quietly and with dignity, to helping people in the community in, in, in their own way. And, and were always well respected. No problems at all with the children growing up. So those old families still have roots in Mahaika. <laughs> you know, there are many people connected to those families still living in Mahaika. The school itself, as I said, was the epicenter of life in the community. But it was the people in the community who made Green Hill. Some of the older families and those that came when the land was made available to many families. The Hopes at Good Hope, which was right next to the Church of the Resurrection. And that cluster of land from Good Hope to Malvern Lodge, the entrance of Malvern Lodge, was sold by a gentleman called Mr. White. He was a white Barbadian. And Edie Motley was the real estate agent but there were two acre lots, so you had the Hopes, the Coxes, then there was a gentleman, Mr. Scott, who had a house there. I don't know if he owned the land. And then there was a Mr. Skinner who owned the land. Too. Mr. Skinner died sometime in the early 70s, I think. But it is interesting that Mr. Cox was a shopkeeper and a baker. So he used to have these pungent wonderful smells of bread and flour <laughs> in Green Hill. And he had a brother called Rupert, who was a butcher who lived on the other side of the street in Green Hill, further down close to the corner, near the entrance of um, Malvern Lodge, which was owned by Mr. Critchlow. Mr. Critchlow was the grandfather of the late Trevor Ruther, who was in agriculture for years. Michael Rutherford, whom you, should, you will know very well from CBC, and Shirley Rutherford Morris, who worked with Barclays Bank and then Marriott, I think, and worked for many years in human resource management in the hotel sector in the Washington, D.C. area. I think she lives either in Virginia, Northern Virginia, or in Maryland, but I know she's in the, still in the D.C. area. But that was Malvern Lodge which was a plantation, small plantation of about 23 acres. And I think it, the Power family acquired it, Mr. Denzel Power, sometime around 1959-60, I think around that time. When the Power family moved to Green Hill, some of the boys ran the streets with us as children growing up. And Mr. Power turned it into a dairy farm. 
and he did very well there. The children had to work very hard, I can tell you. And um, the boys in particular, with Alwyn, was more involved in his studies to be a solicitor. Then there was Asquith, Carl, Orville, Tyrone, and Michael. And the girls who were there at the time on the run were Madge, who moved to Canada. She taught at Buxton for a while. And then there was young Sharon, who was still in Barbados and active with the, um, the daycare centre for seniors at St. Barnabas Church, now that she is retired and working. But those were, and that was another large Green Hill family. But they did dairy farming before it was then sold. And Mr. Rearside bought it and turned it into quarrying. And there's now some commercial activity going around near the entrance and so forth. And there was a raw iron business. I think it was short, short raw iron business that no longer exists, but they were there for, for several years in, in Mahaika. Close knit community. I think the reeds were there at some stage. But it was a community where everybody knew each other. But there was a link where people only had to walk through Friendship Gully to get up to Friendship Plantation where Yorkshire cricket field is. And in Tutus, you were at Hollisford Turning and St. Matthew's School. And the Church of the Resurrection is affiliated to um, St. Matthew's Church in Hollisford Turning. Interestingly enough, you know, both my mother and grandmother were christened at St. Matthew's Church. And I discovered recently in doing some family searches that as we were working on a project on our family history, we discovered that my great-grandfather was born in Friendly Hall, where my brother Tony lives. And that's a small development directly opposite St. Matthew's Church. So there was a close tie all the ties all the time between St. Matthew's and Green Hill, and Hollister Turning and Green Hill. But the old families, all the boys went to Butson School, and all the girls went to Grace Hill School. And that included all the families from the Hopes, you know, the um, brothers who were the grandsons of, and the granddaughter of uh, Mr. Critchlow, who owned Malvern Lodge, where Rayside is occupied. Rayside um, Company occupies that area. And the brothers and the Hopes, you know, the children all went Buxton, the boys to Buxton, the girls to Graceville in Spooner's Hill. And there was other older families that were there with us over the years, the Knight family, our neighbors. There was the Pilgrim family too. They had be shuttle between Green Hill and Spooner's Hill. And they were connected to the Neblet family too in Spooner's Hill. But they, all the boys went to Buxton. And there were like seven boys and three girls. And they all did exceedingly well academically. And most of them migrated to the New England area, the Boston area. And about two of them are in law, Dr. Caleb Pilgrim, Avery Pilgrim, who won a Barbados scholarship. Well, there were other families too, you know, along that strip. There was the Marshall and Nurse families, the Ford families, small families, Carmichael. And then a little further down, you had holders. The Bellamy's moved into the area. Winfield Bellamy, who was a mechanic, and the, the parents, he and his wife, were, his wife was a wonderful lady, who were the parents of Pauline Bellamy, the, um, the designer and so forth. I remember they were very close to my great aunt, who lived next door to them. Before, before they moved her further up Green Hill, and with the mechanic building business, the auto business is still there run by the sun. And that's on the spot where the other kings used to live. Frank King, I told you, Marion Ford and Lady Grace Franklin and the others. That spot is now occupied by the Bellamy Garage in Green Hill. And then where you are, where, where um, there's a hardware store, is it home improvement? The left hand side going north, right. That the Rodneys used to live there. There was Mr. Rodney who was a Guyanese, he was a pan boiler. And his they had his daughter was Jocelyn Jean Rodney, who was 
a post, a post mistress in the post office department. Um, she attended Queen's College. And a son who was a couple years older than me, that he was quite irreverent, Joybert Urkel Rodney. Most Arizonians will remember him. He was a character. Unfortunately, he died in the early 70s in an automobile accident in London. Because by then he had gone up to England and joined his mother, who hadn't gone to England, and the younger son, who I think is back here working in the area insurance in Barbados, I think, you know. But, um, yeah, he all Batsonian boys. And David Bourne joined the police force, David Anthony Bourne. He has the Mia Minimar in Green Hill near Mahaika. He was an inspector of police and he was very active representing the police, Bar Royal Barbados Police as it was known then in attending meetings of Interpol in um, Lyon, France and sometimes in Washington. But we're still close to him, you know. It was interesting that the kids, you know, have, a lot of them have remained in touch. Those that have migrated have remained in touch with all of us. The, the, and, the, and the lynches who were overseas, the kings, the pilgrims, all of us connect with each other still. There's a lot of us sat on the same benches in elementary school. And the, 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 that foundation at Buxton School, Kayla Pilgrim, who lives now in um, Atlanta and who did his studies in Massachusetts at Tufts University, then London School of Economics, the Sorbonne in France. He did his doctorate at Cambridge, and then he did law at Yale. And he was in the Foreign Service for a couple, a few years. But he still remembers the book that he received when he was going to Commonwealth, leaving Buxton to go to Commonwealth for Mr. Arthur. The late Mrs. Eileen Robinson Cumberbatch was a phenomenal lady through her teaching and her giving. Yes, perhaps I should emphasize that. Through her teaching and her giving, she touched the hearts of hundreds of Barbadians and made a difference in their lives. In fact, her name is emblazoned throughout the community of Greenhill and surrounding areas. In 2004, Dr. Henderson Carter, who was the head of the History and Philosophy Department at the Cape campus, he summarized her in his book titled Shaping a Nation, Principles of Barbadian Schools, 1900 to 1980. There's further good news. Michael King is the godson of the late Mrs. Eileen Robinson Cumberbatch. He also had the very good fortune of sitting at her feet while he was a student at the Butson Primary. In celebrating the late Mrs. Eileen Robinson Cumberbatch and uh, the students of the Butson School, he is resolute in his view that the grounding that they will have had, especially at the primary school level, with Eileen Robinson Cumberbatch. I think that was critical. And she kept in touch with all of her students all over the years. They'll always come and visit her. And she and her late husband, Ben, they will travel to the UK, to Canada, the US quite often. On most, on most occasions, they were the guests of her former students, you know? And they, she did a lot of things for them, even looking after their interests while well, they were abroad, you know, their property interests, their tax interests. They really did a wonderful community work. An interesting development took place in Green Hill, especially when there were a lot more young children who came out of what we call the new land, the, the four avenues, and attended Buxton School. That's when the school had to be expanded and there were the enrollment got larger, and Eileen Cumberbatch started a cub troop at Buxton. That was around 1958-59. A lot of the young kids were actively involved in cubbery, and by 1961, she took the troop to, to Trinidad to a major jamboree that was held in, in the country just a year before Trinidad's independence. And the following year she took the, 
group again, at least most of them, to Grenada, to another jamboree. In 1964, she left to go to university in Newcastle in England to study for a diploma in elementary education. And when she left, that was the end of the Cub Troop at Buxton School. But she was the first female leader of a Cub Troop, boys Cub Troop in Barbados. And I can tell you that a lot of the kids in the community used to look forward to that. By then I had left um, 1957 to attend Common Mare School for a year and then the next year I was transferred to Harrison College. But, you know, because you were young with some of the kids you grew up with, you're always in and out of the school still and playing on the school grounds or on our property. But, um, but she was a very dynamic teacher and had time for every person. And even way past her retirement age, she was still actively involved with the Buxtonian Old Scholars Association and um, actively involved in their activities, you know. And I'm um, quite loved by all of the students because she was the only female teacher there for many years. Probably the first female or the second female teacher there. But the thing about it is that she used to spend close to half of her salary every month supporting poor people in that school, buying uniforms, buying material and making uniforms for children, going into Lewis Gap, Story Gap, and elsewhere begging parents to send their kids to school not to keep them at home because they couldn't afford it. And I knew she used to buy uniforms for them or buy the materials and make the uniforms herself. Those teachers were social workers. And, and I'm sure that happened in many other villages and school districts in Barbados. They had to be. They had to be because there were people who really needed some help and did not know where to turn to. Because Barbados could have been a very was a very difficult place for many sectors of our society. And those are the days when people went, boys went to school barefoot. You know, and, um, and that was happening in Barbados up to the early 1970s. This is not a, an old thing. And interestingly enough, all of those schools that I have mentioned, Grace Hill, Montgomery, Buxton, and Sharon were all affiliated and established by the Moravian Church. Right? Now, Grace still used to be a school during the week, Monday to Friday, and on Sundays there was a church, a Sunday school. Ditto Montgomery for a while. But Buxton was never a church, never was converted in a church, but it was established there. But it really I remember Sir George Jalin, whose fat late father was a headmaster, I think, at Shrewsbury in St. Philip, telling me once, either in Brussels or Geneva, in one of our European encounters when we were doing business together, that um, we were quite fortunate to have attended a school like Butson School, which was one of the most outstanding elementary schools in Barbados. Between the 1940s and 1960s, many of the schools in the Windward Islands were headed by Barbadians. Mr. King now celebrates a Barbadian man who went to a larger island. In fact, he went to the Northwestern Caribbean and there he expanded secondary education in Jamaica. Mr. King describes him as... One of our brilliant students was a gentleman called Euclid King. Um, he happened to be the godson of Mr. Arthur. Uh, Euclid went to come, he came from the area of St. John the Baptist. You may know his, of his brother Luther King, who was a stalwart playing cricket for the BCL, as well as at Banks Breweries. But Luther left Buxton and went to the Barbados Academy. He was younger, he was like around Tony's age group, in the late 70s. And then Euclid, was with my, around the age group of my brothers, Carl, more so than Horace, a little younger than Horace, and maybe around the same age as Carl. But he went to Combermere and did very well. He and Walter Burke were childhood friends at Combermere School and remained friends for life. And then he came up to Harrison College and he won the UCWI exhibition, which in those days were five scholarships 
that were awarded to the best students in the Caribbean. So there were people who won the UCWI scholarship for the Caribbean, eh? as well as the Barbados scholarship. So the guys who won both gave up the UCWI scholarships in those days because the Barbados scholarship paid more than the UCWI scholarship to go to Jamaica. But he was a brilliant mathematician. And in fact, in the 1950 books and magazine, there's a little article he wrote about French mathematicians. I will make copies of them for you. But it is an amazing thing in the story for Euclid. Euclid went to Commonwealth Excel and then did sixth form at Harrison College. And he won one of the UCWA exhibitions. Did very well that morning. I think he got a first class on his in physics and maths and had a scholarship and he was at Cambridge University and I remember he told me that he, he was studying nuclear physics in the mid 50s in Cambridge the late 50s and the Jamaican government begged him to come back home to help run the Department of Education and Euclid was very kind to me whenever I used to go to Jamaica on business and he unfortunately died Massive heart attack in September 1993. I, I was working in the Bahamas at the time when one of his friends contacted me and told me that he had died. But um, when I watched the champs, athletic schools, athletic championships in Jamaica, and I see all of these schools, secondary schools in Jamaica, because there were very few, he more than anybody else was responsible for the development and the expansion of secondary education in Jamaica. Euclid S. King. Who brought credit to his nation through his good work in Jamaica. He too is deserving of a full story. Now based on the presentation, you might see elements of social stratification in Greenhill. People who came into the community from elsewhere and established businesses and provided employment for members of the community. The sociologists amongst us might think of this as evidence of social stratification in the community. Let us continue to learn from a man who lived it. How did he see it? We never worried about social status or anything. All they want to make sure that we did not get into trouble. Don't go and steal anybody's food crops or fruit or anything. We had enough at home. There was no need to go anywhere. But I know some guys though who used to go into um, some of the plantations and would check out the, 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 um, the juicy canes and they will devour, <laughs> I have to say devour, many of the juicy canes in some patches, you know, they go several yards inside, several feet inside, and just harvest them and eat them. When the people came to harvest, they saw open patches, juicy canes gone. But we never did, did that. And then we had friends too who worked at the um, Warren Sugar Factory, and guys used to go and um, get liquor, as they call it, from the sugar factory. What a lot of people don't know that there were some caves right there from Cave Hill where Edgar Memorial School was. And those caves ran all the way up to Warrens. So the guys would go and steal the canes and that were on the trucks in the Warrens yard. And when the watchman come running, the guys disappear. But you didn't know the guys went down through the caves and went back down to Grisettes, the top of the hill by Grisettes and so on. We didn't do that, but some other well-known Barbadians told me those, that story a few months ago. And when my late brother Horace once got lost in the caves and someone had to go and fish him out, bring him out one day. But they, they gave kids, there was a cave, hence the name Cave Hill. And they started right near Edge of Memorial. It's on the main road in Cave Hill. When you pass Rock Dando, on the left-hand side, you go around a corner and as soon as you pass the on the left-hand side, it was just a small little space. I don't even know if it was as big as this lot that I'm living on, where the school was. It was just a building on a small space. There was no place really for the children to play and that sort of stuff. And just down the drop was gazettes down below, you know. That's why when they moved the school, they never built anything there on this spot. 
and, and, and obliquely opposite across the street, the Brazilian Holiness was building a church and they've had to abandon the project because there's a big cave under there. You know, but that cave ran all the way to Warren's and the more adventurous people used to go to Warren's and, um, and explore the caves. So one of my good friends told me that they used to, he, he lived in Goodland, but they used to go and steal caves from Warren's and disappear. The watchman can never know where to find them, but they used to go back down through the caves. And <laughs> <laughs> and with that fun-filled experience of the youngsters who explored the caves in the community, yes, the geological features, we end this week's presentation of My Community. Mr. King has consented to being back with us next week to wrap up this mini-series on Green Hill. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. See you next time. <laughs>